Um, let me go ahead and share my slides. We didn't test this earlier, but I'm sure it works fine. Here we go. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about treatment effects. And uh, this is very basic and introductory, so there's no prior knowledge about this topic necessary. Um, you can download all of the materials here at this website. I posted it in the comments window a little while ago, but I don't know if it's still there. Um, I can post it again at the end, or you can take a quick screenshot of this. But uh, all of the materials, the slides, the data sets, the do files, and everything are located here. Uh, so just go there and grab the zip file. So this, like I said, this is very uh, introductory. So what I'm going to talk about first is just the idea of potential outcomes. And, uh, and then we're going to go through and talk about some of the basic estimators that are used uh, in causal inference. Now, in Stata, this is actually pretty old. This, uh, these are the things that were added in Stata 13. So these are sort of the original standard bread and butter kinds of causal inference estimators. That we've added a ton of things since then, but you got to start somewhere. And if you'd like someday, I can come back and talk about some of the more modern ones. But there are loads of variations and extensions for dealing with other uh, situations. But we're going to talk about the six sort of original core bread and butter estimators today and see uh, how they work. We're going to walk through and take them apart and see how they work. And then we'll wrap up by talking about how do you pick one. Um, there are six of just six of these. How do you know which one to use and when? So we'll talk about that a little at the end. And we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. But if you have questions along the way, I don't know if you have the ability to unmute your microphones, but please feel free to interrupt at any point. Um, easier to answer questions along the way instead of finding slides later on. Okay. So I like to start these, uh, these causal inference talks with a cautionary note because I think there's a lot of uh, misconception around these these methods, that there's nothing in these treatment effects estimators that magically extract causal relationships. Um, I hear this more often than I would like. I'll hear overhear people talking or see things on discussion boards where someone says, well, I was using linear regression, but then I decided to use propensity score matching because I wanted it to be causal, or I wanted to use structural equation modeling because I wanted to do causal. And it's the the what seems to be implied is that there's something about the choice of estimator or the choice of statistical tool that makes it causal. And while that's a piece of it, it is a tool. It's not just the estimator or the math or the software that that extract magically extracts these causal relationships. There's more to it than that. And what you really need is a solid underlying scientific rationale uh, along with the proper statistical tools. Uh, in order to sort of make a causal argument when you're dealing with observational data. So we're going to go through and see how this works today, but I just like to start with that, that just because you use a particular command in Stata doesn't suddenly make all the problems of observational data just magically disappear. So what do we mean by treatment effects? So uh, treatments and outcomes. Treatments, uh, and, and that's what we're focused on, things that are, um, we're interested in the relation, sort of a cause and effect relationship between some sort of treatment or event and an outcome. So a treatment could be something like a new drug and the outcome of interest could be something like blood, blood pressure levels or cholesterol levels. Uh, it could be a surgical procedure. It doesn't have to be a drug. It could be a surgical procedure and the outcome could be something like patient mobility or it could even be a job training program. Uh, it doesn't have to even be medical. This could be a job training program and the outcome could be um, either employment, yes or no, or wages, uh, increasing or something like that. It could even be on a larger scale. These sorts of methods are used in advertising. So it could be something like an ad campaign uh, designed to increase the sales of, of a particular product. So these concepts are used in a variety of fields in a variety of ways. It isn't always just about a uh, drug and, a, and blood pressure or something like that. So the example that we're going to use today is one of the, the classics in uh, in the causal inference literature, partly because it's so obvious that you could not do an experiment with this um, that it's become sort of a classic in the literature. So consider whether or not a mother's smoking behavior affects the uh, birth weight of her infant. Um, in an ideal world, you know, if we were not considering ethics at all, uh, what we would do if we were purely interested in experimental design is we would assign some mothers to smoke and we would assign other mothers to not smoke 
and when we would weigh their newborn babies to see if smoking uh, affects the birth weight of their children. Well, obviously, this is not just unethical, but absurd. No one would ever design an experiment like that. But we would like to very much know whether or not smoking affects the birth weight of infants. And so we really, while we really want to know the answer to this question, we also can't do this experiment. <laughs> and so this is a case where we really have to, to wrestle with how are we going to determine this? How are we going to determine whether there's a, a causal effect of smoking on something like infant's birth weight? So um, we can only really do this using uh, statistical methods. We can't do this using experimental methods. So the fundamental problem with doing these kinds of observational studies is that the subjects themselves get to choose whether or not they belong to the treatment group or not. So for instance, the mothers in this example are going to self-select or choose whether or not to smoke. And that brings with it all kinds of problems because maybe the same factors that influences a mother's smoking behavior also influence the birth weight of their child. Maybe uh, heavier mothers tend to smoke or something. I don't know. I'm just making that up off the top of my head. But there could be factors that influence a mother's choice to smoke that also influence the child's birth weight. So it would be very difficult to isolate the effect of smoking and rule out other possible factors when we're dealing with observational data. Okay. So with causal inference, what we really want to do is statistically replicate the conditions of an experiment. We want to estimate the unconditional means of the outcomes for each of the treatment levels. We want the outcomes to be at least conditionally independent of the treatment. So what we're going to do is rather than randomly allocate the treatment to some people and not to others, we're going to try and model the treatment allocation process. We're going to try and statistically unwind this thing so that we can come up with what we hope are conditionally unconditional means or probabilities or whatever odds for the outcome uh, for each of the treatment groups. So I promise I'll wrap, wrap up with the jargon and stuff here in a moment, but we need to establish a little bit of jargon and then I'm going to walk through how we actually do this. So one of the important terms or concepts in uh, the causal inference literature is the potential outcome also called a counterfactual. And the idea is that what if we were talking about a mother who did smoke? So we observe a mother who did smoke, We could and we observe the birth weight of her infant. We could ask the question, what would happen if this exact same mother who did smoke, what would her birth, the child's birth weight have been had that exact same mother not smoked? Okay, that would be the, the theoretical ideal. Now that's impossible to observe, because we can't, we don't have a time machine. So we can't observe a mother who smoked and then observe her child's birth weight and then sort of rewind time and have that exact same mother not smoke and then observe her child's birth weight. We can't do that. But that's the, the idea, this potential outcome or counterfactual. What would have happened had the exact same person not been treated or had the op either or someone who was treated not been treated or someone who was not treated been treated? and then observe their outcome under the two conditions. We can never observe the same person under both treated and untreated conditions. But what we can do is we can imagine this as a missing data problem. We can say, well, we observed one person under one condition. Well, let's treat the other condition as a missing data problem and come at this at least statistically from that point of view. So what we're going to try to estimate then are called potential outcome means. Uh, you often see this abbreviated or the acronym POMs. That stands for potential outcome means. And that's the means of uh, the Y1 and Y0 are the, the potential outcome means in the population. That's the theoretical thing we're trying to estimate. What are the means and the treated group if everyone was treated and no one was treated? The average treatment effect then, often uh, abbreviated ATE, is the mean of the, the mean of the difference between the potential outcome means, okay? So basically Y1 minus Y0. What's the mean of the difference between the potential outcome means? And then there's a related concept that we'll talk about later called the average treatment effect on the treated, the ATET. And that's the average difference in the potential outcome means only among the subjects who actually received the treatment. And often that's of interest to people for particular reasons to their field of study. 
The main two I see most people using are the potential outcome means and the average treatment effect. But sometimes we want to see the average treatment effect among the treated. Okay. So how are we going to actually estimate these things? Well, we need to make some assumptions first. So first we need this conditional mean independence assumption. And that's the idea that after we correctly model things, once we've done our modeling that we have conditional, conditioned on the model and the covariates and the other things we've done, that the, we have independence between the treatment and the potential outcomes, okay? There's also this overlap assumption that means that if every individual, at least in theory, could be in the other group, okay? So um, any a mother who was a smoker, at least in theory, could have been a non-smoker. If that's not possible, then that violates this overlap assumption. Um, an absurd example might be uh, uh, having males in the group who couldn't get pregnant to begin with. That Well, that's not really the treatment, but that's part of it. But that's the overlap assumption. Anyone who's in the treated group, at least theoretically, has to be. It has to be possible that they could have been in the untreated group. Same thing with the untreated group. They have to at least theoretically been. It needs to be theoretically possible that they could have been in the treated group. So that's this overlap assumption. And the independent and identically the IID uh, sampling assumption ensures that the potential outcomes and treatment status are unrelated to the potential outcomes and treatment status of everyone else. Basically, we don't have siblings, we don't have repeated observations and things like that, at least in the scenarios we're going to talk about today. There are um, variations on what we're going to talk about today uh, where we can relax some of these assumptions. But for what we're going to talk about today, these are the main assumptions. And that overlap assumption is a really, really big one. All right. So let's look at some pictures and walk through an example to see how this works. So let's, uh, this is just a, a sort of a abstract graph here where on the horizontal axis, I have mother's age. So left is younger, right is older. I haven't labeled them intentionally because we're just going to talk about the idea here for a moment. So the horizontal axis is mother's age, left is younger, right is older. Uh, the vertical axis is her infant's birth weight, newborn infant's birth weight. And lower is lower weight, higher is higher weight. But again, it's just abstract for now. And I've it's a scatter plot. So I've plotted the scatter plot with the smoking mothers who smokes outcomes are in red, and the non-smoking mothers are plotted in green. And so if we just stare at this scatter plot for a moment, it looks like there are a couple of things here that we notice. One the red dots tend to be lower than the uh, green dots, which suggests that mothers who don't smoke, the non-smokers, have infants who generally weigh more than the infants of the mothers who did smoke. But the other thing we notice is that the mothers, uh, the red dots tend to be shifted a little more to the right. So the smoking mothers tend to be a little bit older, and the non-smoking mothers also tend to be a little bit younger. And so these are a couple of features of the scatter plot that we uh, just want to take into account. So what we want to think about with this potential outcome framework is we want to ask the question, what would the outcomes have been? And I'm going to switch to the next slide here. What would the outcomes have been had the smoking mothers not smoked? And what would the outcomes for the non-smoking mothers, what would the outcomes for the infants of the non-smoking mothers been had they not, had they smoked? And so what I've done is the observed values are plotted with solid dots, solid red and solid green. The potential outcomes, the unobserved, things we wish we had observed but we didn't, those are plotted with circles, with the little hollow dots. So those are the potential outcomes. That's the imaginary data that we wish we had but we can never really observe, okay? So those are the potential outcomes or the counterfactuals, the what-if people or the what-if data. So how are we going to estimate these things? How are we going to make use of this idea? Well, what we can do is we can fit a regression line for each of the two groups. So what I can do is fit a regression line for the mothers who smoked, and that's the red line. So I'm going to take the data, the, the points in red, and I'm going to fit a regression line for only the mothers, the dots in red. And I'm going to do the same thing for the non-smoking mothers. I'm going to fit a regression line uh, the green regression line, only for the data plotted in green, the dots in green. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take those two regression lines and I'm going to then estimate what is the expected 
birth weight, what's the expected birth weight for mothers who did not smoke? And what's the expected birth weight for mothers who did smoke? So rather than concern myself with the observations directly, I'm going to concern myself only with the expected birth weight in the two groups. Okay. So the green line is the expected birth weight for mothers who didn't smoke. And the red line is the expected birth weight for mothers who did smoke. Expected birth weight of the infants. So what am I going to do with this information? Well, what I can do is I can talk about the difference between the expected birth weight of a mother, for instance, at the same age here, this yellow line is the treatment effect. That's the difference between the expected birth weight of a mother who didn't smoke and the expected birth weight of a mother who did smoke at the same age. So I'm taking age into account here and I'm com comparing the expected birth weight of, in the two groups, okay? So again, let me walk through this numerically and maybe this will make more sense. So I'm going to use this data set. This is probably the classic data set in this literature. Uh, it's published by Cataneo in 2010 in the Journal of Econometrics. And this data set, and it's available in that download zip file that I posted earlier. Uh, it contains B weight, which is the infant's birth weight measured in grams. I have MB smoke, which is an indicator for whether or not the mother smoked. M married is an indicator for whether or not the mother is married. M age is the mother's age. F age is the father's age. M edu is the mother's educational attainment. And prenatal one is an indicator for whether or not the mother had a, a prenatal visit in the first trimester. So those are the variables that we're going to be using in this. So this is just a quick listing of the first uh, nine observations here, 10 observations. Um, so I have birth weight, uh, whether they smoked and so forth. And the thing that I'm really interested in here is birth weight and smoking. So what I'm going to do, let's walk through this little exercise. Go back to imagining this graph right here. I'm going to fit a regression line for the non-smokers and fit a separate regression line for the mothers who did smoke. So first up, I'm going to use state as regress command. I'm going to type regress B weight. So birth weight is the infant's birth weight. M age is the mother's age. And I'm only going to, I'm going to restrict this regression model to only the mothers who did not smoke. That's what this if MB smoke equal equals zero. So I'm going to fit this regression model only on the non-smoking mothers. And then I'm going to use these coefficients. So the intercept is 3,108 grams and the coefficient, the slope coefficient for mother's age is 11.36. So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to generate a variable, generate creates new variables in Stata. I'm going to generate a variable called Y0. Y0 is going to be my potential outcome, assuming that the mothers did not smoke. So generate Y0 equals the intercept 3,108 plus 11.36258 times the mother's age. Now notice I didn't restrict this only to the mothers who didn't smoke. I'm generating, I'm using this regression model that I fit for the non-smoking mothers and I'm generating this variable Y0 for all the mothers in the data set, whether they smoked or not, okay? So now, whether you may not be able to tell, but I just switched slides. So now what I'm going to do is fit the same regression model again for the mothers who did smoke. So regress B weight MH if MB smoke equals one. So this regression model is fit only for the mothers who did smoke. And after I fit this model, I'm going to use the coefficients to, again, generate a variable called Y1. Y1 is going to be the intercept, 3237 32, minus, because the coefficient's negative, minus 3.95 times the mother's age. But again, notice there's no if at the end of this. I'm doing this for all the mothers in the data set. Okay. And then I'm going to generate a variable called TE, and TE is going to stand for treatment effect here. Treatment effect is Y1 minus Y0. Okay. So it's just the difference between those two variables I created. Y1 is the expected uh, birth weight, assuming the mothers did smoke, minus Y0. Y0 is the expected birth weight, assuming the mothers did not smoke. Okay. So that's what I've done is I've fit these two regression lines. Now let's look at the actual data here for a moment, because to me, this is this makes this idea crystal clear. If I look at observation number 40, this first row of data at the top, this infant's birth weight is 2,790 grams. The mother's age is 29 years old, and the mother did not smoke. This mother is a non-smoker. 
And I, I have three variables that I created. Y1 is the expected birth weight for that infant. That's the expected birth weight for that particular infant, assuming that the mother did smoke. Okay, now we know the mother didn't smoke. That's what we observe. But Y1 is the expected birth weight for that infant, assuming that the mother did smoke. Y0 is the expected birth weight, assuming that that mother did not smoke, okay? It's not the observed birth weight, because in this case, we did observe the birth weight, and the mother is a non-smoker. We have that data, but what Y0 is, Y0 is the expected birth weight, assuming the mother did not smoke, okay? So we have two birth weights now for the same mother, or same infant of the same mother, we have the birth weight assuming the mother didn't did smoke and the ex expected birth weight assuming the mother did not smoke. So what we've done is we've calculated the two counterfactuals. One assumes the treatment we, one assumes the mother did get the treatment, the other assumes the mother did not. And the difference between those two expected birth weights is the treatment effect. Okay? And so for infant number 40, the expected treatment effect is 315 grams. Okay? So uh, had the mother not uh, had the smoking in this case, smoking would have led to, I mean, we're going to use causal jargon here. Assuming that the mother did smoke, the infant's birth weight would have been 315 grams lower if it had the, had this particular mother smoked rather than smoking. But again, the, the punchline to this or the, the, the central concept here is we're not talking about we're not taking the average of the observed uh, birth weights in the smoking mothers and the average of the observed birth weights in the non-smoking mothers and taking the difference between those averages of the observations. What we're doing is we're estimating the expected birth weight under the treatment condition, the expected birth weight under the non-treated condition, and we're taking the difference between those two. And that is the central idea, the counterfactual idea. It's the what if. What if this mother had smoked? What if this mother hadn't smoked? Okay. Once we estimate those two things, we can calculate the mean of these variables. So I can estimate the mean of Y0. And so the mean and the no, Y0 is the potential outcome assuming that none of the mothers smoked. Okay. This isn't the mean birth weight for infants for mothers who didn't smoke. This is the mean for the infants assuming none of the mothers smoked. And that's 3,409 grams. So the potential outcome mean for the non, assuming no one smoked is 3,409 grams. Y1 is again the potential outcome mean, assuming that all of the mothers smoked. So had all of the mothers smoked, we would expect their uh, average, the potential outcome mean, the average birth weight to be about 3,132 grams. And then the difference between those, the mean difference between those is 277, minus 277. So we would expect uh, smoking to cause a 277 gram lower birth weight in the mother's infants. Okay. So that's the idea. That's the, if we were doing this manually, that's how we would calculate these things. Okay. Now, what what do we care about with this? Well, what we've done back in state of 13 is we introduced a suite of commands called T effects. And this particular flavor of treatment effect or causal inference is called regression adjustment. And so what we're going to do then is we can do all of this in one command. We can type T effects, and then the flavor of treatment effect is RA, regression adjustment. And then we have two sets of parentheses we need to fill in. The first set of parentheses is the outcome model. So the outcome here is birth weight. That's the thing that we're interested in. And I have one predictor of birth weight, which is mother's age. And then the second set of parentheses is the treatment model. So the treatment variable is smoking. That's the thing we're interested in. Does smoking cause an effect on the infant's birth weight? So the first set of parentheses is the outcome model. The second set of parentheses is the treatment model. Okay, so then I've included the option ATE. So you can either, you can estimate the ATE, which is the average treatment effect. And it shows us right here, it's minus 277. And that matches what we estimated up above. And it also shows us the potential outcome mean in the non-smoking group, which is 3,409. And that much matches what we got up here above. Okay, so we can do all of those steps I just showed you with one command called T effects RA. 
So I could also do this using the dialog box. And a lot of times I think the dialog box makes it a little more clear uh, what we're actually doing. So in the T, there's a treatment effects dialog box. And at the top, you select among these six estimators. The one we're using right now is called regression adjustment. With regression adjustment, there's only an outcome model. Okay, so we're going to specify the outcome dependent variable birth weight and the outcome independent variables, which in this case is MH. That's the regression model that we're going to fit. And we could fit other kinds of models like probit or logit, but in this case, it's a linear regression model because birth weight is continuous. So we're going to fit this as a linear regression model. And then we're going to specify the treatment model, which in this case is only the treatment variable at the bottom. So MB smoke is the treatment variable and treat that treatment variable. You can imagine that it's one of the independent variables in the regression model, but we're going to specify it separately down here as treatment. And that way Stata knows very specifically that smoking is the treatment variable because you could have other independent variables in the model that are, they're just adjustments or covariates. But the thing that we're interested in the treatment variable is smoking. So again, when you click okay, that will fit the model. Now, you can click on the Stats tab and tell Stata what you want to estimate. Do I want to estimate the average treatment effect in the population, the average treatment effect only on the treated, or do I want to estimate the potential outcome means? To this day, I don't know why. This has been out for years. I don't know why we can't just report all three at the same time, but for some reason there are issues with that, and so you select which what you want to report. So again, I can type T-Effects RA, tell state of the outcome model in the first set of parentheses, the treatment model, in this case, the treatment variable, and the second set of parentheses, I want the average treatment effect and no log just suppresses the uh, iteration log, the log likelihood history, okay? So again, uh, using causal language, we would say the average treatment effect is that smoking causes a 277 gram lower birth weight in mothers who smoked relative to mothers who did not smoke. <laughs> and the mothers who did did not smoke, their uh, potential outcome mean was 3,409 grams. Mothers who don't smoke have infants who on average weigh about 3,409 grams. Now, I could use the ATET option, and this would apply the what we just did only to, it will only show us the mean for the mothers who did smoke. It's the average treatment effect among the treated. So it's going to estimate this average treatment effect only among the mothers who did actually smoke, okay? And that number is a little bit different here, and it also shows us the mean for the non-smokers, because remember, even for the mothers who we observed to smoke, we're going to estimate the expected birth weight under both conditions, whether they smoked or whether they didn't, okay? So that would be the average treatment effect among the treated, okay? We could also use the PO means option, and this would simply display the uh, potential outcome means in the two groups. So this would show us the expected uh, average expected birth weight for the mothers who didn't did smoke and who did not smoke. Again, I don't to this day I don't know why we can't just report all three of those or all four of those numbers in the same output, but that's the way it works. I didn't write this so. So any questions up to here? The, the rest of this will go more quickly, but regression adjustment is easy for illustrating the basic ideas. So any questions up to here? Okay. So with regression adjustment, we're primarily modeling the outcome. So we're gonna have a regression model for the uh, modeling the outcome. Next, we're going to talk about inverse probability weighting. And inverse, inverse probability weighting, or IPW, models the treatment. We're going to fit a model for the treatment. So here's the idea. Again, I have the mother's age. This is hypothetical. The mother's age on the horizontal axis. Birth weight is on the vertical axis. And again, I've plotted the, uh, the observations, this time with the hollow dots. But I've changed the size of the circles. And so the circles represent the probability or the propensity that the mother belongs to the other group. So notice that the circles farther, in this case, mother's age, the older a mother is, the, the more likely she, well, let me phrase it differently. The younger the mother is, the more likely she is to have been, the younger a smoking mother is, the more likely she is to have been in the non-smoking group. Similarly, for the non older non-smoking mothers, the green circles, the farther they are to the right, the older the non-smoking mothers are, 
the more similar they are to the smoking mothers, the more like that they're more likely to have been in the other group. And so what we're going to do is calculate the probability that the mother belongs, could belong to the other group. Actually, what we're going to do is calculate the probability that they're in the group they're in and then take the inverse of that. So I'm going to do this using logistic regression. So in this case, I'm going to fit a logistic regression mo model for the probability of smoking. So in this case, the dependent variable is the indicator for mother's smoking. We're, model we're building a model for the treatment. What are the covariates that are uh, influence the mother's choice to uh, engage in the treatment, in this case, smoking? So in this case, I'm using mother's age. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm using mother's age as a predictor. I'm trying to predict the probability that the mother smokes. So I fit my logistic regression model. I get my odds ratios. And then I'm going to use Stata's predict command to predict the probability of the outcome for every observation in the data set. So every observation in the data set, every mother gets a probability that they smoked based on their uh, the mother's age. And then I'm gonna generate a couple of variables. I'm gonna generate, well, I'm gonna generate one variable, but it's gonna be different in the two groups. I'm gonna generate a variable called I IPW, inverse probability weight. And that's gonna equal one divided by the probability of smoking for mothers who did smoke. And then I'm gonna replace IPW with one divided by one minus the probability that the mother smoked if the mother didn't smoke, okay? So it's the inverse of the probability that the mother belonged to their particular group, okay? So inverse probability weighting. Well, so far all I've done is calculate the inverse probability that they've chosen to be in the group that they're in, okay? So once I do that, I have these weights, and so I can see these weights in the data set, the IPW. So I see the probability that they were in their, uh, the probability of smoking, and then IPW is their inverse probability weight. Then what I'm going to do with this inverse probability weight is I'm going to fit my regression model again for smoke, for birth weight. So I'm going to type regress birth weight, MB smoke is my treatment variable, and I'm not going to put the mother's age in here. I've already accounted for mother's age in the weights. That's what the inverse probability weights are for. So regress birth weight, smoking. Smoking is my treatment variable. And then I'm going to use A weights equal IPW. So I'm going to weight each of the observations with their inverse probability weight. And when I fit this model, what I end up with is an effect, the average treatment effect. I have MB smoke here. The coefficient is minus 275.5595. That is the average treatment effect. And the intercept here where it says constant, that is the potential outcome mean for the non-smokers. Okay. So how would I do that? This is a technique called inverse probability weighting again. I would use status T effects suite of commands again, but this time I'm going to use the IPW option. And now I still have two sets of parentheses. Remember the first set of parentheses is my outcome model. And the second set of parentheses is my treatment model. Well, this time the outcome model only has the outcome variable. There's no model, it's just the outcome variable birth weight. But the second set of parentheses is the treatment model. And now I actually do have a model in that set of parentheses. It says MB smoke is the treatment variable. M age is a predictor of smoking, at least I believe so. And then I use comma logit to tell it that I want to use a, a logit link to model mother's age uh, as a predictor of mother's smoking behavior. Okay. And then ATET reports the average treatment effect. And so if I look at the results here, it shows me the average treatment effect is minus 275, which is what I got above. And the potential outcome mean in the non, for the non mothers who don't smoke is 3,408. Same thing I got up here above. Okay. So it's another way, this is a different technique for uh, estimating the average treatment effect and the potential outcome means. I, again, I could do this with a dialog box. And what I like, again, about the dialog box is now it's showing clearly that there's an outcome variable and a treatment model. So the outcome variable is just birth weight. And then the treatment model, I have the treatment dependent variable is smoking. So that's my treatment variable, but it's the dependent variable in my treatment model. And then I have predictors of treatment, which is mother's age. 
And then I specify my link function for the treatment model. And in this case, I'm going to use uh, logit link function because uh, smoking is a binary treatment, okay? Binary outcome in my treatment model. All right. So again, I could run this again and get my uh, potential outcome means if I wanted. So, or I could get the average treatment effect just like I did before, or the average treatment effect among the treated. So those are the two sort of bread and butter uh, estimators, sort of the main two beginning ones. What's really cool about these two is you can actually combine them. So I, what I can do is combine inverse probability weighting with regression adjustment. And what's nice about this is it allows me to fit both a, an outcome model as well as a treatment model. Uh, and because of this, it's often called the doubly robust estimator. And the reason it's called doubly robust is that you, through simulation studies and there's theory to support this notion that as long as one of the two models, as long as either the outcome model or the treatment model, as long as one of those is specified correctly, you should get consistent parameter estimates. You should get correct uh, parameter estimates, okay? So again, this is why I like the dialog box because this really makes this obvious. Now, if I use the IPWRA estimator, this doubly robust, it's inverse probability weighting with regression adjustment. So I'm combining these two into one. Now I have both an outcome model and a treatment model. So in the outcome model, I have an outcome dependent uh, variable, which is birth weight. And I can include outcome independent variables, predictors of the outcome, which include mother's age, prenatal one, which is that indicator for prenatal visit in the first trimester, uh, whether the mother is married, whether this is her first baby or not. So I can include things that I believe are other predictors or covariates for birth weight. And that outcome model is linear. And then I have a treatment model, which is another regression model where the treatment variable is the dependent variable. So smoking is the treatment variable that I'm interested in. And I believe there are things that might predict or influence the choice to participate in the treatment or not, to smoke or not. And so I might think that being married might influence smoking behavior. Mother's age might influence smoking behavior. If this is their first baby, that might influence uh, first, uh, might influence smoking behavior. And then med, I forget what med stands for. But anyway, the point here is, and I'm using a probit link for my treatment model. The point here is that I have two regression models that I'm working with simultaneously. I have an outcome model, which is linear, and a treatment model, which is a, uh, oh, this time I'm using probit rather than logit, but you can use either one because it's a binary treatment. As long as one of these two models is specified correctly, I should be able to trust my results. So now what I'm going to do is fit this model, and I've uh, made it a little bit more uh, complex here. So the, the command is TFX IPWRA. And now, before we had these two sets of parentheses, and it was a little weird. Why do I have two sets of parentheses? But hopefully now it's a little more obvious. The first set of parentheses is the outcome model. And in typical state of syntax, the, the first variable is the dependent variable in the outcome model, and everything else is a predictor. Then we have the three triple slashes that tell Stata this command continues on the next line. The second line then, the second set of parentheses is my treatment model. And so the first variable in the treatment model is the dependent variable in the treatment model. So smoking is the treatment that I'm interested in and it's the dependent variable in this log logistic regression, excuse me, probit model. And then I have predictors of, uh, predictors of the treatment. And I've used comma probit to tell Stata this time I'm using a probit model. Then I have the three triple slashes. So this command continues on the next line. And I've used the PO means option to display the potential outcome means in each of the two groups. And I've also used the option A equations. That shows me the other equations, the auxiliary equations. So if I wanted to see what are the coefficients in the regression model for the outcome regression model for the non-smoking mothers, that's OME0. And then I have the second set of coefficients, or really it's the third set labeled OME1. Those are the regression coefficients for the linear regression model predicting the outcome model, okay, for those mothers who did smoke. And then TME at the bottom, that's the treatment effects model. So the treatment effects model for everyone. So those are those logit parameters for the logistic treatment model. Excuse me, I'm sorry, probit. I should have just used logit the whole way through so I wouldn't confuse myself. 
You don't have to include A equations, but if you want to see all of the coefficients that were used to fit this model uh, in the process of this, you can just use this A equations model and it'll show that. The main thing we're interested in, though, are these coefficients, the potential outcome means. Or we could have put T effects here and it would show us the treatment effects, which is what I've done here, ATE. So the average treatment effect here is minus 231.87. So again, the interpretation is that smoking uh, causes a 231.87 gram lower birth weight among mothers who smoke versus mothers who don't smoke, okay? So that's IPWRA. And that one is very popular again because it allows you to model both the outcome model and the treatment model. So now there's a variation on this called augmented inverse probability weighting or AIPW. I'm just going to show you this quickly because the math is, I don't think seeing the math is very helpful. Um, but again, AIPW allows us to have uh, an outcome model as well as a treatment model. So that's why this one is also rather popular. Um, and I've used a probit link here. So it's just another variation on this. And uh, there might be certain circumstances where you want to use this. But the idea is the same. We could use the PO means option to show the potential outcome means and A equations to show the coefficients for the auxiliary models that were used to estimate those potential outcome means. Okay. Now, nearest neighbor matching. Those are the, uh, that's sort of, these first four sort of belong to one grouping. The last two are the matching estimators. And there are two flavors of this. Uh, one is nearest neighbor matching, and the other is called propensity score matching. Nearest neighbor matching is a little bit easier to explain, so I'm going to walk through that one in some detail, and then I'll come back to uh, propensity score matching. So again, back to this idea of it would be great if we could take the exact same mother and observe the same mother under both treatment conditions. I want to observe mother A as a smoker, and I want to rewind time and observe mother uh, A had mother A not smoked. And we can't do that, obviously. We don't have time machines. But what one of the things that we can do to get close to that idea is called matching. We want to find, take a mother who did smoke, say, and we want to find another mother who is as similar to her as possible. And so we want to match the mother's in the two groups, we want to find a treated mother who is as similar as possible who was not treated. So we're going to match on covariates. So in this case, I'm going to match on the mother's age. So if I find a mother who's a smoker, and let's say that that mother is 25 years old, what I want to do is I want to go in my data set, I want to go through my data set and find a 25-year-old mother who did not smoke. And so the idea here is that mother should be very similar, at least in terms of age. And you could do this with lots of covariates. You could find a mother with the same age and race and uh, location where they live and education level. And in theory, you could match on a whole bunch of covariates. So you're comparing apples to apples, so to speak. Uh, treated mothers and non-treated mothers who are very similar to each other with regard to a collection of covariates. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to match these mothers based on these covariates, and then we're going to estimate their treatment effects. So again, we can go to the treatment effects dialog box here, and I'm going to select, this has an outcome model. So birth weight is, again, the outcome-dependent variable. I have my outcome-independent variables, uh, married, mother's age, father's age, and so forth. So those are predictors of outcome. And I'm going to match on these. And then I have my treatment variable, which is smoking. So the idea here is what Stata is going to do is go through the data set and it's going to try to match as best it can. It's going to find a mother, a treated mother, a smoke mother who smoked, who matches on as many of these covariates as possible to a mother who didn't smoke. Okay. So this is quite a trick. This would be very difficult to do manually, but Stata is going to do that for us. Now, it's going to be difficult to match exactly on continuous variables. Things like married indicators, that's not as difficult to match on. Finding a married mother who smoked and a married mother who didn't smoke, that's not terribly difficult. But when you start talking about matching on both father's age and mother's age, multiple continuous variables, this becomes really challenging. And so you can uh, approximate these things, and there are other options, and we're not going to go into all the details, but uh, there are other ways we can do this. So we can also specify which variables we want to see exact matching on. 
So the indicator variables, mother being married and prenatal, we could, indicator variables are pretty easy to get an exact match for. So we're going to say we want exact matches for uh, married and prenatal visits. And the others can be pretty close. And I'm just going to leave pretty close hanging in the air for now. Now, when you have multiple continuous variables, uh, there is a bias that can be incurred. And so there's a correction for a large sample bias using these multiple continuous variables. And so I can specify those in here, mother's age, father's age, and year, uh, mother's years of education. Uh, I can also specify the number of matches per observation. So rather than just doing one match, I could do two or three matches if I have a large enough data set and if I think there are enough that are going to match. Uh, this might be something you'd have to experiment with and see, do you really have enough variables, enough observations to get multiple matches uh, for each treated person? Anyway, so I can click OK and State is going to do <clears throat> a lot of work in the background to do all of this matching. And then it's going to report to us the, again, the uh, average treatment effect. So in this case, the average treatment effect is minus 210. So smoking, using this nearest neighbor matching technique, estimates that the average treatment effect is minus 210. Mothers who smoke have babies that are on average 210 grams lighter than mothers who don't smoke. So it's just another way of estimating the average treatment effect. Now, last but not least is propensity score matching. And I come from the biostatistics world where this is actually probably the most popular in the biostatistics world, uh, propensity score matching. So how does this work? The problem with doing nearest neighbor matching, and that's what this grew out of, is uh, solving a problem. The problem with nearest neighbor matching, it is, it is very, very difficult to match on multiple continuous variables in particular. Uh, how are you going to find a mother who smoked who, where the mother is 36 years old, the father is 38 years old, and finding another non-smoking person observation where the mother and father are both exactly those ages. That's very difficult, often impossible to do. And so rather than doing nearest neighbor matching, what you can do is you can actually estimate the probability of being in the treated group <clears throat> for a collection of covariates. So rather than matching on each covariate individually, what we're going to do is fit a logistic regression model for the treatment. So MB smoke, MB smoking is the treatment variable, obviously, and it's binary. I'm going to fit a logistic regression model for smoking, and I'm going to include, uh, is the mother married, the mother's age, the father's age, the mother's level of education and prenatal visits, and all of those things I'm going to include in my logistic regression model. And then I'm going to predict the propensity score. Propensity score is just a fancy word for what's the probability that the mother smoked uh, given all of these covariates. Well, given all of those covariates collapses that collection of covariates into one number, that propensity score. So then what I can do is take those propensity scores and I can match the mothers based on the propensity score. And it's much easier to match non-smokers and smoking mothers on their propensity scores, because that's only one number, than matching on a collection of individual numbers, okay? So we're going to match, we're going to take a mother who smoked, look at her propensity score, and then find a non-smoking mother who has a propensity score that's very similar. And you can actually do this with more than one, because it's only one number. It's a lot easier to match on multiple uh, propensity scores. So essentially what we're doing, again, is collapsing that collection of covariates into one propensity score, then matching on that propensity score. Then we're going to use that uh, information to estimate the average treatment effect and the potential outcome means, uh, just like we did before. Now, this in this uh, flavor, there's only the outcome variable. There's no outcome model. There's just an outcome variable. All we're modeling here is the treatment. So we have a treatment model where the dependent variable is smoking and a collection of covariates that we use for the propensity score matching. And notice at the bottom of the dialog box, it says a number of matches per observation. And this one, it's a little easier to get away with doing two or three matches per observation. And how to choose that is in the documentation as to whether what are the advantages of doing two or three or things like that. Okay. So the uh, command here, again, is T effects, and the flavor is PS match for propensity score matching. And we again, we have our two sets of parentheses. In this case, we have only the outcome variable, which is uh, BW weight or B weight. 
And we have our treatment model, which is MB smoke is the dependent variable and then our covariates, okay? Uh, so the average treatment effect using propensity score matching is minus 229. So again, we've estimated that average treatment effect. There is no estimate of the potential outcome means um, with propensity score matching. You only get the treatment effect here. So if you want to see the, the potential outcome means, uh, you can't do that with propensity score matching. Now, one of the things that we need to check here, uh, or one of the assumptions I mentioned earlier, is this overlap assumption. And so one of the things we can do is check this using T effects overlap. Just type T effects overlap, and we can see what are the propensity scores for the smokers and the non-smokers. And if there is no overlap here, this is saying that some of the smokers had a probability of being a non-smoker, and some of the non-smokers had a probability of being a smoker. There has to be some probability or possibility that uh, the mothers could have been in either one of the groups. And if there's no overlap, then that violates this assumption. But here we see that they overlap pretty nicely. Okay. So the obvious question then, we've, we've seen how to use six of these different estimators to estimate the, at least the average treatment effect. How do we select which one? How do we know which one to use? So what I've done here is used estimates table to display the average treatment effect for each of these different estimators. So with regression adjustment, the average treatment effect was minus 277. TFX IPW was minus 275. IPWRA was minus 231. Uh, let's just look, I'm not gonna read every one, but if we look at the two extremes, nearest neighbor matching estimates the average treatment effect to be minus 210. At the other extreme, we have regression adjustment, which has an ATE of two, minus 277. That's in the kind of the neighborhood, but they're not exactly the same. But they are very similar. You're not going to get wildly different results, and you're certainly not going to get them in different directions, depending on the estimator. So how do we choose? They, the, first off, the results will be fairly similar. So it's not that critical as to which one you choose. But there may be certain situations where some of these work better than others. So these are some rules of thumb uh, that I put together with the team that actually wrote these estimators. And I believe these rules of thumb appear in the documentation. Uh, so first oh, up, yes, rules uh, of thumb. Uh, oh, quick question. Uh, uh, here, let's have a question from the audience. I see what go ahead and unmute. Oh, yes, Sorry, go ahead. Talking. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, my question was about the violation of the overlap assumption in the yes. PSE. How do you correct for that? Uh, to my knowledge, you can't. If it's not possible for them to, to be in the other group, then you really shouldn't be using these methods because it, it, the whole thing hinges on the idea of the counterfactual, that a treated mother could have been a non-treated mother. A smoker could have been a non-smoker, and a non-smoker could have been a smoker. Mm -hmm. That's a central assumption to the whole, the whole counterfactual idea. So I don't think there's a statistical way to, to correct for that. Excellent. Okay. Any other questions while we're paused? Not from my end. Okay. Um, okay, so let's just read through some rules of thumb really quickly. So under correct specification, all the est estimators should produce very similar results. So if the models are correctly specified, it shouldn't really matter. But under certain circumstances, it could make a difference. So in you, when you're pretty sure you know the determinants of the treatment status, when you're confident in what are the predictors of the treatment, then IPW is probably your best way to go, either IPW or IPWRA. So if you're confident in the predictors of treatment, go with IPW. If you're more confident in your outcome model, so you don't really know what predicts who's in the treated group, but you're pretty sure what are the things that predict the outcome, then regression adjustment is probably a better uh, a better possibility. If you're not really sure of either one, or you are sure of one or both, then the doubly robust estimators work pretty well. Uh, that might be your best bet, either AIPW or IPWRA. Um, these are very uh, very popular for that reason because they give you sort of two chances. This doubly robust property it gives you kind of two chances of getting it right. Nearest neighbor matching, I don't see this used a lot um, simply for the fact that adjusting on multiple covariates is extremely difficult. So if you have a lot of continuous covariates, uh, nearest neighbor matching is not a good idea. Um, it's just going to have 
there are some issues with possible bias and there is a bias adjustment that's built into Stata, but matching for multiple continuous covariates is really challenging and probably should be avoided. If you do, if you are in a situation where you have lots of or many continuous predictors of treatment, you might want to try propensity score matching. Um, but again, you need to be fairly confident of your predictors of treatment because there is no outcome model. Whereas if you're not really sure of either one, might be better to go back to IPWRA because then you have sort of this doubly robust property. So uh, the again, the IPW estimators are not very reliable when the estimated treatment probabilities get really close to zero or really close to one. Um, so you need some sort of non-trivial or, or you don't want a, 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 you don't want these treatment probabilities to be really close to zero or really close to one. Okay. For those reasons, these doubly robust estimators are very popular and they're, they're probably a good choice. When in doubt, maybe go with IPWRA or AIPW. Um, so that would be my suggestion. Uh, so again, my cautionary note, well, let me say one thing before I wrap this up. These, as I mentioned at the beginning, these are the six basic bread and butter causal effects uh, estimators built into Stata. We introduced these, I believe, in Stata 13, and we're now on Stata 18. We've included now all kinds of uh, variations on these for dealing with um, situations where you have correlated data, panel data, if you have um, other kinds of issues uh, with endogenous treatments and things like that. There are all kinds of variations on these things built into Stata now. So this is only the very tip of the iceberg sort of bread and butter estimators. Um, so if you're interested in this, check out Stata 18 and look through the causal effects manual. That manual is on the website. So even if you don't have a copy of Stata, just search Stata causal manual or something like that. And it will take you to the manual and show you all kinds of variations on these uh, for when you have uh, other situations, okay? And I have some other talks on those and I'd be happy to come back and share those sometime uh, if you're interested. But uh, anyway, so again, this is kind of the bread and butter. And I just want to repeat my cautionary note um, that I said at the beginning. There's, there's nothing in these commands per se that magically extracts causal relationships. So just because you use... Uh, TFX IPW does not suddenly mean that your results are causal. You still need to have some sort of underlying scientific rationale for why it's causal. Okay, you need you need good data and these these statistical tools. If you have a good underlying scientific rationale, these modeling techniques are capable of extracting these causal relationships. But you can't just switch from the regress command to T effects and expect that suddenly everything is causal and, th and that's all there is to it. So there's a bit more to it than that. Um, there are a couple of blog posts that I've written, a couple of intro to treatment effects, part one and part two. I've written these up. Um, there is a book called Causal Inference for Statistics, Social and Bi Biomedical Sciences. Um, this is a kind of now a modern classic text on the subject, and there are many others that are out uh, now, uh, from this perspective, uh, I guess I should point out, maybe I should even add a slide that points out that the counterfactual perspective is one perspective on causal inference. Um, the, the two others that I would identify, and I think others do as well, one is the use of structural equation modeling. In the behavioral sciences, a lot of people use structural equation modeling to get at these causal relationships and talk about the interrelationships of things. The other is the DAGS approach due to uh, largely founded by Judea Pearl. And he has uh, a series of books on causal inference and that's another approach to this. So I guess I should have prefaced this by saying this is one perspective among uh, what many people would call three different perspectives on causal inference. Um, and again, you can read the treatment effects manual on, uh, on the uh, internet. So thanks for being here today. All the slides are available on the web. Again, just go to tinyurl.com slash tfx, and you can download all the slides and data sets and do files and recreate all of the stuff in the slides. I'm happy to hang out and answer questions as long as you like today. But if you think of questions later on, uh, just shoot me an email at chuber at stata.com. I will warn you, I am notoriously slow at replying to email because I get a lot of it, but I also travel a lot. I spend a lot of time on the road 
and not very much time at a computer anymore. And so I'm pretty slow to get back to you. So if you don't hear from me within a week or two, shoot me another email and, and poke me again, because I'm not ignoring you intentionally. You probably just drifted off the main screen and I haven't scrolled down far enough. So, so thanks again for being here and uh, I'm happy to take any questions. I just okay. want to say thank you so very much again for doing this. Uh, it's fantastic here. And just thank you again. Oh, thanks for having thanks me. For Happy having to do this. So we'll have to come back and do it again sometime. So that'd be phenomenal. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, I guess if there are no questions, I'll move along.